Hey, I, you know, I know we'll have trials of many kinds because I read the Word of God, but <clears throat> I also know that I can have joy in abundance. And, uh, you know, I can get into that critical thing. Anyone? Anyone? Uh, but I hate that because that isn't me. Uh, that's the enemy. Uh, and recently we... Uh, <laughs> I, I live in Tennessee, and Michael, my sweet and wonderful, fabulous husband, still lives here in California because we're trying to transition uh, his job there. So, I mean, that, that in a nutshell is just a lot, right? Uh, especially because there's no honey to do my honey-do's at the house. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I need some ceiling fans. Oh, dang it. Where's Michael? The internet is out. Here's me at my house in Tennessee. Honey. And he's here. The internet is not working. Because <laughs> he's an IT guy. And you know, from far away, he fixes it. Because Jesus loves me. Thank you, Lord. Let me pray. And then I want to give you an analogy this morning. Um, I woke up with, I mean, I hardly slept last night. I do not know what the Holy Spirit was doing to my feet and legs, but there was something happening there. I think I was having a dance party with the Holy Spirit by myself, laying next to my husband. I kept kicking him and kicking him. Not, not meaning to kick him. It was my legs were just like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> At one point, he just reached over and like did the bear hug. I think it was like, shh, quiet, be still. So, Father, thank you that we don't have to be still. Thank you that this is a time of action in your church. Not action out of compulsion, action out of passion. Father, I thank you. Jesus, thank you that you gather our meek little praises and you put them in a basket and call them gold. Only you could do that. Lord, thank you that from this place of intimacy, you are pouring out your spirit over California. And Lord, I thank you that you didn't leave one person untouched when your body takes dominion. So Lord, this morning, ignite us with a passion that never goes out, that we would be the light on a hill, not just for this city, but for this state and for this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. I was uh, <clears throat> on a platform in Brazil Really big church, 28,000 people. I know that's hard to fathom, isn't it? Like, I thought we had mega church. They got the mega, mega mother church. They got the huge. When I when we pulled up, I was like, wow, Yo's been there with me. And uh, I said to her and to Paul, hey, you guys got to preach. You're going to preach tonight. Is that, is that okay? She's all, yeah, get it. I'm going to do it. And Paul's like this, what, tonight? What? What? I love how different we all are. You know? Yo's like, fire! Boom, boom, boom. That's how her. And Paul's all, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, didn't, I don't have all my notes together. <laughs> and then I love our family, our agape family. There are 110 of them now in nine nations. And they are all leaders and equippers. They're all apostolic. They are all training up an army of God because they put God first in everything. Some of them have just come in. Some of them are being trained. Some of them are in our school but they all have one thing. And this one thing is, if we don't act, they won't know him. If we don't move, they will stay in darkness and bondage. If we don't take our rightful place, they will never know. I was on an airplane last week, two weeks ago. I don't know, it's all a blur in my life. Uh, somebody just texted me, some pastor in Oklahoma and said, how come there's nothing on your calendar in July? I was thinking, is there nothing on my calendar in July? Wow, hallelujah. But I opened up my calendar. I'm like, my calendar's packed in July. I didn't text her back. I texted our, our people that manage our website. I said, how come the calendar's blank in July? And I haven't heard back yet. That'll be really interesting because I'm like, you need to fill that thing up so people are not texting me going, how come you're actually taking a breath? <laughs> so good. So I was on this platform uh, in Brazil. I want to talk about this this huge church. They were Baptist. I know y'all are like, they let you in the door? What? <laughs> Listen, beloved, they, they're still Baptist. Come on now. They're still Baptist, but they're spirit-filled Baptists. Come on. 
So the interesting thing was when I was up there on this platform uh, speaking, I heard the Lord say, Brazil, he, he said to me, you love the fire down here. I said, I just love your presence in worship down here, God. I really, I, I love how these people are just in abandon uh, down here. They're just always just worship, worship, worship. And they're real family centric. They're includers. That's key. Unity, right? Unity brings the anointing. We know that from the Psalms. And there's a blessing forevermore. So <clears throat> in this church, while I was up there and the Lord was talking to me while I'm, while I'm preaching, and I felt like he said to me, watch what I do in this next season. Brazil will be the largest sending nation of missionaries to America. And do you know, that, that was about, I don't even know what month is this. That was October uh, at Voice of the Apostles in Brazil. And uh, I, I announced it because I heard it so loud. I was like, and they all went, Rah! you know, screaming and, and yelling praise to the Lord. And then two months later, there was a news report that came out from a Christian, um, uh, like a data analysis. And they said, Brazil was number two already. Release the word of the Lord and watch what happens. I believe that the Brazilian people are going to come to America to bring unity and passion. And it's not that we don't have it. It's that we need to be stirred up once more. A couple of different things, uh, because our, our audio team, thank you so much for being back there and holding the fort. They're so important. Um, I wanted to show some pictures this morning, but I, I'll just tell you about it. How many of you have been to Basel, Switzerland and the Rhine River there? Anybody? Yeah. So the Rhine River in Basel is it's quite large and it's stunning you know, all along these incredible architecture. But I went there, we had about an afternoon off one time, and I, I was there several years ago. I, I go several times a year, non-COVID. And uh, I was standing on the banks of this river, and I was mystified as somebody came up to the river bank and took their clothes off. But underneath, okay, you guys, get your, they had a bathing suit on underneath. Well, listen, I stuck my toe in that water. It was the summer, and I was like, oh, heck no. Like, I don't even go in the water in Southern California. It's so cold. That water is ice cold. And the person proceeds to, to strip down to their bathing suit. And then another person came. And then they did the same thing. Like, it was the most normal thing. I was like, what are they doing? And then they, they have a bag. And they take their clothes that they had, and they roll them up, and they stick them in the bag. And they have a towel. And they put the towel in the bag. And then they put these swim caps on. Like, it's a whole thing. I'm just mesmerized. I'm like, this is interesting. And then they take the bag and they catch air. And they lock it up. And then they tie it somewhere on their body, waist or arm or something. And then they, the river's got this current. Like, you can't believe it. It's like, and then they jump in. I did some research on that. Plus, my friends were there who live there. I go, what in the world is going on? They said, those are the morning commuters. I said, look it up. So I had some film, actually, this morning. I was going to show you. The morning commuters. So I think we can all quit complaining about our morning commute. <laughs> you know, I'm just letting you know that, I mean, in the freezing cold, they just, and, and this, they have to have these, these uh, contraptions these, that catch air, you know, this bag, uh, because they can get mowed over by boats. All right, I, I, the things, the analogies the Lord gave me this morning as I was thinking about that. Listen. A commuter float, they come down to the river ready to go. Hey, there's a river of the spirit right now. Are you ready to go? I was sitting there laughing this morning. They have everything they need in this little bag. Oh. I just thought it was so funny that they do not care what anyone thinks. Sometimes we don't jump in the river because we're so worried about what everyone thinks. And then some of us don't care what people think, but we have an attitude about that. I'm just talking about me. 
they're carried away. <clears throat> they're carried away by this current. And do you know that they, they, they are not without obstacles. There are tree limbs and boats. There are all kinds of other people. Imagine that other people are in the river. Some of them are clueless and others are champions. There's a lot of tolerance going on in that river. Welcome to the body of Christ. But do you know that they still have to participate even though there's a current? Because if they don't, they'll get swept to the other side of the river. And that's where the boats come. There are buoys for the swimmers. They have to stay in their lane. What is the lane God gave you? But as they agree with the current, they are swimming. They just have help. You and I are moving with the current of the Holy Spirit or we're not. Will we still have to participate? And then they get to the other, they get all the way into the city. Way, I mean, miles. Morning commute. And they get out. They take all their stuff out. They dry themselves off. They put their street clothes on. They take their bathing cap off. And then they go to work. I don't know how they get home. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> uh, I just feel like I watched them. They were smiling. They were laughing. They weren't grumpy. They were invigorated. And this morning, the Lord said, are you invigorated? I was like, I'm so convicted right now. I am invigorated, but I had two cups of coffee, so I'm super invigorated. Are you invigorated for what's about to happen? Because if we don't get a new level of hope, we will not have a new level of faith. And the faith is only going to grow the more we surrender. Sometimes I just can't believe that I have to die to my opinions. <laughs> I actually like my opinions. <laughs> I'm sure you like yours too. But I know when I have overstepped gr the grace of God. And sometimes there's nothing like having your family around that. Some of you are like, whoop, she went there. Yes, I did. Sometimes the Lord allows every button to be pushed in you so that you will conform, not as a slave, but that you will conform to his image. This book that I just finished, nobody wants to write a book. Everyone wants to say they've written a book. <laughs> Writing a book is like birthing a child. And it seems like it's never finished. It just goes on and on and on and on. But why I wrote this book, um, my publisher and I had an argument for about five hours when I was being smuggled into Switzerland across the German border. I was in a car for nine hours after flying overnight and my publisher decided to blow up my phone, telling me they didn't like the title that I picked, which was God's Like That, with a question mark and an exclamation point. Because I thought, if I wasn't saved, I'd pick that book up. God's Like That? They were like, we, we, we can't have that title. <laughs> I like that title. We don't like that title. I don't care. <laughs> this is after no sleep, no filter, everything's broken in my brain that of, of grace. It's gone. And I am like, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I can type fast with my thumbs. <laughs> and Jessica Tate, who is with me, she's amazing. She goes, what are you doing? You, your face is all twisted up. <laughs> I go, look at this. They don't like my title. She goes, I love that title. I go, you're not helping me because they're not, they're not budging. So we, for, I'm not, I am not exaggerating. For five hours, we go back and forth on titles. As if I could think of another title when I am that bone tired. I've been flying all night. And they have to have it right now. I'm like, that's the title. Well, now we've all conferred. Like, <laughs> you and who? <laughs> you know? Anyway, it, it, it wasn't pleasant. And then I realized, well, you know, this is a book about Jesus. And the Lord says to me finally, because we can't agree, we're going back and forth, back and forth. And I was like, cheese ball, five books by that title. Hate that, blah, blah, you know, that was me. And then the Lord says to me, all in the fifth hour, are you tired yet? 
I go, I was born. I'm already tired. I was tired when I got here in the car. And he said, give them the book. Let them call it Everyday Supernatural. I said, that's a cheese ball title. I don't like it. He goes, you can write the next one and you can call it God's Like That. Give them the book. And I went, okay. <laughs> okay. The book title is what the book is about. And I, I'm not, a, I don't like the super obvious. I like things that make me think, which is why I liked God's Like That, question mark. But apparently nobody else would think that was as riveting as me. So the reason why I wrote this book was because I'm so, so passionate about God's people rising up and doing what God said. I am so tired of people waiting in line for me to pray for them because I have a microphone. That doesn't make sense. Everybody is anointed because you're called by the name of the anointed one, Jesus Christ, period, the end. Everybody can pray for the sick and they get healed because it's the Lord that does it. So we've got to annihilate this garbage that it's one or two people. Because it isn't everybody, it's all of us. And, and there isn't anybody like you in the body of Christ that can fill your spot. Nobody like you. So this book is all about our team. And my dear friend, Kathy Lee Gifford, some of you know who she is. She lives uh, in Franklin near me. And she was not uh, really all enamored about the Holy Spirit. She has the richest, most beautiful relationship with Jesus. But when her friend got healed and delivered and set free and said, you should meet this woman and her team, she was a skeptic. And she writes about that. She wrote the forward for this with Randy Clark. And they didn't even know each other. And I'm here to tell you that God is converging on streams. He is bringing all kinds of people together who never would have been with each other. Kathy Lee met Will Hart. Then we all went to dinner at her house. Will Hart with Iris Ministries is a good friend. They lived in our house this summer. But I said, Will, did you ever notice the gift of woo that you have? He goes, shut up, Joe. You have the gift of woo. I go, dude, who gets invited to the governor's mansion four months after they move to a city? You do. Who goes out shooting guns randomly on a property that belongs to a ministry and then some guy who's got the property next door pulls up in an ATV and says, you guys are getting close to my cows. What are you doing? And Will's like, oh, sorry, man. We're not really shooting at anything. We're just out here shooting. And then he goes, oh, we're just poor missionaries. I go, you pulled the missionary card, didn't you? <laughs> Please, sir, we have some more. He goes, he goes, we're just missionaries. And then the guy goes, oh yeah, missionaries with who? And he goes, oh, Iris. And he goes, the guy goes, Iris, I know Iris. I went to Mozambique. Here we go. This is Will Hart's life. This is your life. If you go where God wants you to go, even if it's shooting guns on some random property. Will listens to the Lord and then he just goes. And the guy goes, tells the story how he went to Heidi Baker's place in Mozambique. He knows Heidi, he knows Roland. And I know this guy named Will. And Will, he goes, Will, really? What's Will's last name? And the guy goes, uh, Hart. It's, it's Will Hart. He, they, they were so nice to me, he and his wife. And Will goes with his beard. Yeah. So that would be me? <laughs> I'm talking about out in the middle of nowhere land in Tennessee. And that, that, would be, that would be me. I'm Will Hart. And the guy goes, whoa, you look different. And Will, <laughs> Will tells me. Well, I, I, I interviewed him the other day and he tells me, there's nothing like being fat shamed first thing in the morning. <laughs> I laugh so hard. He goes, that was 50 pounds ago and no beard. <laughs> the guy ends up, he is a billionaire. Why do I tell you that? Because he's kingdom all the way. He owns five of the most prolifically successful restaurants in our area. And he, his heart is open to Iris and has given Will so much. We just had a meeting up at Will's missionary house and the guy sent his taco trucks up there to feed everybody. The things that are happening in the spirit realm, these convergences, these, these holy alliances are taking place every single day.
And I want to tell you, I believe that it is a season of urgency to be ready to jump in the river. I believe that there are generals of God being assembled everywhere we go. I, I don't think it's uh, a mistake that so many people are moving to Franklin, Tennessee, just as so many people are moving to California or Texas or wherever they're going. I find the Tennessee situation interesting because I heard very strategically, if you've heard me speak before, that we were supposed to go there for several different reasons. But what I didn't know was when the house became available that we were able to have, I did not know it was right on the line where the bloodiest battle of the Civil War was fought. And then some friends of mine who had no intention of moving to Tennessee randomly got a word from the Lord and came to town. I got a text message from a, from a realtor that's a friend of mine, and he said, hey, are you home? I said, no. Uh, I'll be home at 4.30. This is two, three months ago. And uh, he said, okay, I think I'm gonna come by. And then he didn't answer me after that. He goes, at 4.10, he goes, are you home? I said, no, I said 4.30, I'm not gonna be home. He goes, oh, too late, I missed you. I'm like, what? what's up? He goes, can you just pray? I just, some friends of yours are with me. And I, we just put an offer in on a house. And instantly I saw this big white house, boom, right in front of my face. And I, I said, oh my gosh, it's the house. Four doors down from me on Main Street. He goes, exactly, how'd you know that? He's not spirit-filled. I go, the Lord just showed it to me. He goes, get out of here. I said, well, it's a done deal, Greg. You, they got the house. Like, it's bidding wars down there. These people, they have no business having a house in Tennessee. Their businesses are in Montana. But they have technology to end world hunger. You're gonna hear about them soon. They bought this house not knowing where my house was. And last week they were there. And they came over and they said to me, look, we believe we bought that house because it's right on the line of the war. This is the battle line. Do you understand? 14 generals came to that battle. The highest number of generals that had ever come to any war in history because they wanted to hold the line. The union wanted to hold the line. 14 generals. There's so much prophetic insight there. I believe God is raising up generals in every area because generals have strategy. And where you have been opposed in your life and you have leadership skills, dust yourself off, get rid of the offense, forgive people and rise up. Get in the river. We've got to learn grace in this season. I want to give you one more analogy and then I want to get into the word of God. Um, Jessica Tate who runs with our team just a little bit. She has her own ministry. She started a nonprofit when she was 21 on the Venezuelan border for refugees. As soon as God touched her, she said, I'm all yours, I'm going. She's, uh, she's a general of generals, she's 34 years old. She has spiritual children almost as old as she is. But she was in a hotel with me one morning and she, she said, hey, do you know how to play roller derby? I said, do I know how to play roller derby? I had the skates, man. She goes, I have no idea what that is. She's 34. If anyone, a product of the 80s, yes, 70s and 80s, roller derby. She goes, well, the Lord uh, spoke to me when I was waking up this morning, and he said, Jessica, it's not about passing a baton. It's roller derby time. And I was like, she goes, do you know how to play? I go, yes, I do. Okay, so we're going to have a visual right now. It's going to be so good. Because you can't make this stuff up. It's so crazy. How many of you have always heard, well, we'll pass the next generation the baton? Let me tell you something. The next generation doesn't want to go by themselves. And where are the spiritual mothers and fathers to help steward the move of God that's on Gen Z and the millennials and Alpha Gen? We need spiritual parents. We can't pass a baton and leave them. That's what people did to us. And we all know how that went. All right. Joe and Preston, come on up here. Linda Brown. Yo, Kathy. Brandon. Okay, Laura, will you come up? Okay, let me see. Beth, come up here, sweetie. Who's about, who's about 21, 22 in here? Come. Kayla. Okay. 
All right, I think I'm missing, who's in their 50s in here? Okay, come, quick, quick. All right, 40s, who's in their 40s? Okay, come on up, yeah. All right, I think this is about as big as we can get. I'd love to get the whole group in here because I did it in, in another place. All right, so I want the oldest people down here. Okay, Beth, you're going to be on the inside, my darling. Okay. Are you arranging everybody? Okay. Kayla, you're on the end. All right. So most of you don't know how to play roller derby, right? Some of you do. Who does? Who knows how to play? Okay. So do you remember the women's roller derby team was like, rah. Like you never wanted to run into those women in a dark alley, right? They had thighs as big as Mack trucks and they were like, rah, you know. So... As I was explaining this in the hotel room to Jessica, she was dying laughing. I said, but the analogy could not be better for where we are going and what we've got to do. So roller derby, when you get into a bind and a tie with the other team, there is a strategy that is used. And it is a way to use the entire team's energy, their know-it-all, their, their, their years of experience. Okay, so on this end, we've got... 40 years of roller derby experience a piece. So you're talking like almost 200 years of experience over here. And then we got Michaela, who just started to play roller derby last year. But she's fast and she's fearless because she hasn't gotten all whipped and beat up yet. She doesn't know, she's clueless. And it's great, because all those ringers down there, they're like, that's right, put the young one out there. Because they can do what we can't do anymore, because we're just a little too stiff. But we've got the experience and the strategy to help them. Watch this, this is so good. Okay, I want you guys to lock arms. Okay, just like that, all right, you good? Good, good, good. All right, now I need you to squat down like it's serious. Okay, if you were, don't burn out your thighs. If we were skating, all right, we'd be like this, right? We'd be moving all together in a line. Remember, it's a wooden track and they take the whole field. The other team is doing the exact same thing, right? And now we're trying to get momentum. We're trying to move. All right, here's what's going to happen, you guys. You can stand up a little bit so some of you don't faint. Okay. <laughs> when you get momentum going, this, <laughs> this, I wasn't looking at you. So this becomes, this becomes the fulcrum here. Beth, as the, the ringer of this, she is the one who's holding it. She's got the most experience because she's been in it the longest. I want you guys to start going this way. So you're going up and go back. Go back, go back. You're going all together. Up. So this is what happens when you skate. Okay, Tracy, you got to go with the flow and back. Okay, go with, with, straight. And because you're going in, a, a, remember, you're going to whip her. This. Whip. Okay, and back. All right, do you see how this could be if you're really moving on skates? Up and back. All right, one more time. Michaela, can you feel that? Like if they, they will whip you. Okay, stop for a second. Here's what happens. The ringer on the end, the youngest player who has tenacity, boldness, fearlessness, but does not have quite the strategy. These guys have the strategy and the experience. She gets flung by the whole team working together into the line of the opposing team and she breaks through, skates to the end and they win. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Thank you players, that was an amazing analogy. Did you did win. You, that's the most important, important thing. Listen, this young person on the end would never be part of the team, the team that wins, unless all of the ages are represented. Amen. And this person on this end will never get to fulfill their complete destiny unless they have all of this and they watch the next generation sail right past them. Are you seeing what God's doing? The analogy of roller derby, study it. They were fierce, they were bold, and they were ready all the time. Yeah. This is a season where we've got to be looking at one another going, 
all right, I'm championing you. This is not about me. This is about us. There are Deborahs and Caleb's being raised up in this hour. I have never seen so many young women getting promoted so fast in my life. It is about men and women together. The Deborah's rising up. Remember, Deborah and Barak. Barak said, I'm not going unless you're going. They were together in this. She carried the spirit of wisdom and revelation that he needed for strategy to win. This is what we need in this day. This year, I heard the Lord. I don't usually get a word of the year. I get themes or I get uh, spots in time as we went through last night. But I had gotten, and I don't know if I I spoke this here before, but I had gotten from the Lord in the middle of the night uh, the word resiliency. And and the Lord spoke to me very clearly that this is the season of resiliency. And I really didn't care uh, to hear that word because I I don't know about you, but it's, it's been, right? I'm like, resiliency, that means things are, okay. But I heard Tracy say it. The Lord said in physics, resiliency is the ability for an object to bounce back after blows. Is that you? But I'm not talking about bouncing back to your, your natural shape. I'm talking about bouncing back into being a living, holy place of God's dwelling where the holy temple, you're a living stone, are built up together so that we're fortified through the resiliency of God for the season that is about to be upon us. The word resiliency is such an important thing. And I I could go on and on if I was teaching a a conference to leaders about reaching the generations. Do you know what's fascinating to me? I studied, I've studied Gen Z. I'm constantly reading data analysis books about Gen Z and how to reach them and, and what their value systems are, why they think the way they do. So, you know, I have a 23 year old son, so I want to understand why does he say the most bizarre things to me? And make sure my mouth is not, what's that? What are you talking about right now? I want to understand, but I want to understand how to reach the generations for Jesus. Gen Z, they are called the generation without resiliency. That's what the world's calling them. So isn't it just like our father to say, resiliency is the word for this year. Because you're going to go in and tell them who they really are. Light them on fire supernaturally with the word of God spoken over them and you'll see them become resilient, boy. They're built for the supernatural. And they are the largest generation we have ever had on this earth. 27%. Who do you think is going to bring in the harvest, everybody? They are. And we get to do roller derby. All right, turn to Acts chapter 2. Verse 16 through 21, we know this. This house speaks this scripture. And this is what's happening in the season. And it's what's been happening since Jesus was here. Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 21 says, This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel, for God says, This is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit, say spirit, Spirit. on everybody. Say everybody. And I will cause your sons and daughters to prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Not some, all, right? I will reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of clouds will appear for the sun will be turned dark and the moon blood red before that great and awesome appearance of the day of the Lord. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen. So you know that this is a direct quote of Joel 2, 28 and 29. And we have never left the season of Pentecost. Hello? We never did. We just stopped participating. When Jesus said that he would pour out his spirit, when he said, wait till you're clothed with power from on high, 
It wasn't for the select group, as much as cessationist thinking would love to say that. That can't be true because of what, what I have witnessed with my own eyes. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of people by now. I mean, we're at such staggering states of cancer, thousands and thousands of cases of cancer healed. But the 49 people that have been healed of fourth stage cancer where they had no chance of living, it was metastasized through their entire body and they were healed in a moment because Jesus Christ is king. He is king over everything. And when I see that this inability for us to remain in a season of Pentecost is really for many reasons, but the biggest one is this. If we were born by God, to take dominion over this planet. Do you remember? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Take dominion. It's all in there. And then when we don't do that, who is ruling and reigning here? The enemy. You don't take dominion over him? Then you try to take dominion over your neighbor. Ooh. Or your people you run around with. Or we make everything about well, I need to accelerate. They got to decelerate. Those people need to, right? Because if we're not subduing the enemy, we try to subdue everybody else. And if we don't say it, we think it. All right. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. There's a lot of twos going on. Yesterday, today. Jesus, the divine victorious, was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed many powerful signs and miracles and wonders through him. It's clear from the beginning that God sent his son to be the propitiation for all mankind so we would be saved. You don't have to argue that, right? I think that we've forgotten the power, and we talked about that a little bit last night. When you pray, God, let your kingdom come. What does that even mean? God, let your kingdom be made manifest in my everyday life. Amen. Let your kingdom be made manifest when I go get my hair done. I spend more time ministering when I'm getting my hair done. <laughs> Sometimes I come in there on fumes. I literally fly in the night before and I go get my hair done. I'm like, please, don't let there be any ministry in here today. <laughs> and it just starts, you know? The only break I get is when my head's under the water. But it's marvelous because people in the beauty salon are being transformed into the image of Christ. I was in Kona some months ago, a couple months ago uh, at YWAM, and lots of, lots of changes. Uh, there are a lot of ministries right now where the older generation are now turning to the younger generation and they're commissioning them. So I was asked to come over to meet with groups of leaders there who are in that transition phase, the people who are taking over fire and fragrance, taking over the base, doing all of that. And I, I went to just be a mom, uh, whatever the Lord would have. We had these meetings scheduled and things went on. And it was really interesting because the Lord said to me, I, it's not about commissioning. It's about co-missioning. So I said, you know, when the Lord speaks to you like that, he said, unless you all partner with me, there is no mission. So your co-mission is the partnership that you have in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And I mean multi-generational, multi-denominational, multi-rational, every ethnic group represented, every socioeconomic group never divided again. This is the kingdom advancing. This is co-missioning. It's alignment, everybody. It's the recalibration. We have to be in this right place because that verse in Isaiah keeps coming up over and over. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of Jesus' government, there's not going to be an end. But how does, the, how does the government of Jesus expand? It was the key last night. Kingdom ambassadors, ambassadors, ambassadors. If you were not here last night, put your hand up. And the person next to you, tell them what they missed. You are a kingdom ambassador. Ambassadors 
Bring the rule of the sovereign into the foreign land. I could say that and say that and say that and say that, but until we take action, we will live like we always have. If you're having a rough day, you're having a rough season, you need to read Psalm 110 verses 1 and 2, the most quoted scripture of all time. I bet you can't believe that. Yahweh said to my Lord, the Messiah, sit with me as enthroned ruler while I subdue your every enemy. They will bow low before you as I make them a footstool for your feet. Messiah, I know God himself will establish your kingdom as you reign in Zion glory. For he says to you, rule in the midst of your enemies. Commission. Rule, not over one another, over the enemy. What? Do you take authority over things that are coming at you? Over your family? I get up and I'm like, oh no, we're not doing that. No, thank you. Not coming in this house. I won't even be harassed in my sleep in a hotel room. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm on a mission. And I'm going to take authority and dominion because Jesus told me to do that. I know that we are running out of time. I want to get into Zechariah, but I think I'm going to do it this afternoon. There's a call in Zechariah chapter 2 for the Babylonian exiles to come back. Right? I don't know if you've ever read that text. It's so rich. Here, you know what? Can I, can I, can I do like, can I do it? What do you think? Okay. All right. Let me, let me just paraphrase. All right. So, so do, get your Bible out. Okay. And, and turn to Zechariah. Oh, look at that. I forgot I sent those. Okay, great. Gosh, I love preparedness, but I must've been dead when I <laughs> sent them. I didn't remember. <laughs> all right. So the bride of Christ right now needs to be ready just like this. So in Zechariah two verses one through 13, uh, I'm just going to read it. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what its width and what its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And it will be, to, and I will be to her. A wall of fire around. Listen to that, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. The word goes on, and I'm going to jump over this so I can finish up. There is so much in this text I believe is prophetic for right now. In the end of chapter 1, Zechariah witnessed God break and confuse the enemies of Jerusalem. So now he has faith to look to God expectantly. This is key. His hope in this moment birthed faith in the Lord that Jerusalem would not be destroyed. Do you have faith to believe that California will not be destroyed? We have to review the big faith pillars in our life so we can have enough hope so we can move forward by faith and say, when the Lord goes, hey, I, g I gave you a promise. Look up. Look up. I gave you a promise. Behold, he's doing a new thing. This keeps coming up. Zechariah had such bold faith that he actually asked an angel where he was going and what he was doing. How many of us would be like, yeah. He was so engaged in the supernatural. The angel says the city is being measured so computations can be made to secure a wall around the city that will be holding vast numbers of people and livestock. In Isaiah 60 verse 4, there's another reference to this. And this, in Isaiah 54, 2, this time, Jerusalem is being called to enlarge the place of her tent just like we are. The harvest is coming in. You cannot have a closed door. You got to figure it out before they flood in here. What are you going to do with them? They're going to be train wrecks. It's not all on this guy. 
or the leadership team. Hello, everybody. Roller derby. The Lord said, I will be to her a wall of fire all around, and I will be the glory in her midst. The Lord sends an angel to make sure everything is prepared and the prophet knows what is about to happen. And then he proclaims, Jesus, the Lord God, Yahweh proclaims, I'll be the wall of fire. I'll be the glory in your midst. The Lord gives such a directive in this passage of scripture. It's so interesting to me that Cyrus had given the decree for the Babylonian exiles to come back and only 40,000 took him up on it. The rest of them stayed and they put down deep roots in another nation. And then here is God. Here is God. The one who actually exiled them is calling them back. How's your trust level? Do you know how many people out there in this world think it's God's fault that they're where they are? Especially if they were raised in a Christian home. And they blame God. They don't like God. They think God's all about harming them and hurting them. How is that going to go over when you try to just tell them about Jesus? Not so much. But when you show them. You pray for them. You read their mail. And you place your hand upon them and the tangible love of the Father comes through them. They will flood in this place. And they are the exiles that need to come home. I believe with all my heart that the Lord is saying there's a great migration coming. And they're either migrating to the dark or they're migrating to the light. And when you show them the true supernatural power of God, they will come to the light because that still small voice will be awakened within them and they will go, oh, I was born for this. And when you link arms with them and they might be clueless all the way down here on the end, but you stay with them and you teach them, you can have the Caleb's and the Joshua's and the Deborah's all rise up. There is so much more in this text. I can't do it because we've got to break for these breakout sessions that are going to be so riveting to you. Listen to me, everybody. I don't know a lot, but I know there's an urgency on this hour. I can feel it in my guts. I feel it when I go to bed. I feel it when I wake up. I feel it when I'm walking down the street. I feel it when I'm on a platform. I feel it when I'm praying for somebody. It's like a, come on, come on. And if the flood waters are rising, I want to make sure that I have got my buoy bag and I strap it on and I'm jumping in even though I hate cold water. Because the current of the Holy Spirit wants to take you to these places where the gospel needs to be shared. We got to stay with what God is doing in this season. And this is a season and a time of inclusion. All people. All people. So would you stand up? Let me just pray over you. Lord, I thank you for your word. And your word never, ever returns void. Your word, God, will be fulfilled. Your word will stand. You are the majestic God. You are Yahweh. You are El Elyon. You are Yeshua. You are Jehovah Moxie, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shema, Jehovah Said Kenu. You are El Bethel. You are Sir Israel. You are Yeshua. You are the God of glory. And I pray, Father, that you will thunder down like lightning in these breakout sessions. Father, that each and every person here will be mightily touched by your righteous right hand. And that we will have all we need to jump in, not just for the commute, but for our entire lives, over our heads, in this Ezekiel 47 time. In Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen.